On September 23, 1947, a steam train was pulled back to its platform in Amritsar, India. When the doors of the train carriages opened, it was silent within. Scattered inside the compartments were hundreds of bodies. This wasn't the first, nor would it be the last incident of its kind. 3,000 people on that train had been killed, with nearly everyone else wounded. This train, and others like it, would become known as the ghost trains of India's partition. The partition, or split of India, was no small thing. Imagine a single territory about as big as the EU, suddenly getting split in two. That's basically what Britain did to India before jumping ship. Plus, the new border was based on religion. That's a big deal because India was home to millions of Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, and smaller populations of Buddhists and Jains. So all of a sudden, tens of millions of people had to make a choice. Stay in the place they called home, or leave it all behind to start a new life across the borders. This prompted over 15 million people to take part in the world's largest mass migration in a span of just six months. And that's where the railways come in. It wasn't the refugee camp, it was the, the railway station which we went to. In 1947, trains weren't merely a mode of transportation. They became the front lines of the partition of India and Pakistan. Let's start with how the railways were established in the first place, which of course involves the British. During British rule, the empire extracted resources across India for it to use in its factories. But these resources needed to be moved to the ports where they'd be shipped off to mainland Great Britain. So the British constructed the railways for their own benefit, while conveniently funding them through Indian taxpayers. The British also used railway lines to maintain control of the vast Indian landscape by allowing the quick transport of their troops. In fact, during one famine in India, the British used the trains to transport grain away from the people who needed it and exported it instead. And when it came to transporting people, the passenger cars on these trains were initially reserved only for Europeans, with Indians crowded into neglected carriages without even toilets. By the time of the partition, more than 600 million passengers in India relied on the trains every year. When India finally gained independence after more than a century under Britain's divide-and-rule system, tensions between Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs came to a head. See, when Britain split up its former colony, the plan was for India to be Hindu majority and Pakistan Muslim majority. But it drew the new borders arbitrarily, tearing right through these same railway lines and dividing a territory that had previously been won. Dividing India into two countries based on religion meant that millions of people would have to leave their homes so they could end up in the right country. Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs turned on each other, and the partition was marked by widespread violence, including large-scale massacres, communal riots, and sexual assault. Flames of disorder spread through many parts of New Delhi, the scene of our latest camera report from the Far East. More than one million people died in a matter of months. To escape the violence, families across the subcontinent began boarding trains, since they were the most efficient mode of transportation at the time. Some other plausible options would have been trucks, motor buses, or simply going on foot. Railways provided a crucial escape route and lifeline for those fleeing violence. Within just weeks of the new map's announcement, an estimated 700,000 people began boarding India's trains in hopes of finding shelter across the boundary lines. The train journeys usually took several days. We were not having eatable with us, like cattles, herd. People occupied virtually every space available, including roofs and the areas between train cars, leaving very little room for personal belongings. Families were often separated while fleeing, with women waiting at train stations to be reunited with their husbands. But then things got even worse. Trains became the targets of communal violence. Depending on the direction a train was heading, mobs would be able to identify its passengers and their religions. Mobs began boarding trains and attacking passengers of opposing faiths. The walls of the train were only about four feet high, and so bullets were coming freely on top of us. We were there like sardines in the train. My little brother was a gun for example, the attack this video started off with. 
On September 22, 1947, a train heading from Amritsar, India to Lahore, Pakistan was attacked. Six killed around 3,000 Muslim passengers. Muslim mobs also attacked other trains carrying people of different faiths, and Hindu guards were seen looking the other way during Sikh attacks on Muslims. These so-called ghost trains would sometimes arrive at their destinations with only dead bodies on board. Within a year of India and Pakistan being established, an estimated 15 million people had migrated across the subcontinent. But the religious distributions were not clean cut. Around 35 million Muslims remained in India, which is about the same amount that ended up in the western part of Pakistan. And 11 million Hindus stayed in the eastern part of Pakistan, which in 1971 broke off to become modern-day Bangladesh. The partition split apart the subcontinent, and with it, its rail system. 40% of the network ended up across east and west Pakistan, and 60% in India. In 1951, India nationalized its railway system, and eventually the other railways were renamed after Pakistan and Bangladesh. Two major lines, the Bengal and Assam and the Northwestern Railways, were separated from the rest of the Indian rail system. Railways were once a symbol of this vast, unified territory, but in just a few years, both India and its railways had been split into pieces. It wasn't until 1976 when the Samjota Express began running between India and Pakistan, meant to represent cooperation between the countries and the reunion of families. But it's been repeatedly suspended whenever tensions escalate, most recently in 2019. As of this video, the line is still not in use. Even decades after the ghost trains rattled the region, the legacy of such attacks can still be felt. In 2002, at least 58 Hindus on a religious excursion were killed in the state of Gujarat after their train car caught fire. Muslims were accused of setting fire to the train car, and although this is still disputed, the dominoes had fallen. The incident sparked weeks of sectarian violence that killed over a thousand people, primarily Muslims. In 2003, an Indian police officer opened fire at a Mumbai train station, killing three Muslim passengers and one other person. The collective trauma born out of the partition of India, like losing one's homeland, the deaths of loved ones, and experiencing violence, continues to plague the region. Deep-seated communal divides remain between Hindus and Muslims, and there is enduring animosity between India and Pakistan, which has led to multiple wars, countless casualties, and continuing border disputes over regions like Kashmir. As the Indian subcontinent navigates its future, the railways remain a testament to the human cost of division, a cost that, even after decades, both nations continue to reckon with.